Hey there, guys. This is Dr. James Harrington, and this is Medical Statistics Relative Risk versus Odds Ratio, otherwise known as How to Inflate Effect Size. Now, research has a tendency to falsely inflate effect sizes. Okay, Much like some of these perspective paintings have a tendency to falsely inflate the size of elements, just like the moon here. So if you're not familiar with this, both of these moons are the same size, but it certainly seems like the one in the sky is bigger. Okay, Just like this, our job in research is to see through the trickery and see things for what they are, which means we need to be very familiar, in this case, with relative risks and odds ratios. I think this is the reason that Mark Twain uh, made the comment there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. Statistics really are the most insidious of all the lies because it hides behind the disguise of math and science, which we really firmly believe to be true, right? So let's throw up our two by two table and let's create ourselves a population, an N, a total group. Now remember this N may be an actual representative sample of the population. Um, this may be a sample that we selected that doesn't necessarily represent the whole population and that's important when we get to talking about relative risks versus odds ratios and we'll get to that a little bit later. And let's expose a few of them uh, to some kind of exposure. Okay, It doesn't matter whether this is smoking or pollution or contaminated drinking water, whatever the case. And this is going to turn these folks red. Now, some of these people are going to develop an outcome and some of them will not develop an outcome, right? Not everybody that smokes develops COPD. So we're going to put them in their respective groups. Now, remember, similarly, just because somebody's not exposed to something doesn't mean they won't develop the outcome, right? We still have some, uh, some of these folks still develop outcomes. And now we're going to look at the ratio between people who develop an outcome who have some known exposure relative to the people who don't have that exposure and find out uh, how much that exposure correlates with the outcome we're looking for. And we've got two ways of looking at this. We've got relative risk, which is over here on the left side, in which case we look at the two people who had the exposure and developed the outcome as a fraction of all the people who had that exposure relative to the eight people who didn't have an exposure but still developed that outcome relative to all the people who weren't exposed. Okay, this is one way of looking at a strength of association between an exposure and an outcome. Now, in this case, you have a risk of 2 out of 5 if you have the exposure, and you have a risk of 8 out of 20 if you don't have the exposure. And to make this uh, simpler math, we can see that this comes out to 40% and 40%, which is a relative risk of 1. Now, odds ratio, on the other hand, looks at the number of people who had the exposure, who developed the outcome, relative to the people who have the exposure and don't have the outcome. And in this case, you're looking at two people to three people. For every two that are exposed and develop the outcome, there are three that don't develop the outcome. So two to three. This is just like Las Vegas casino odds, right? Now, we're going to take this and, uh, and throw this into a fraction, into a ratio of the people who don't have the exposure and develop the outcome, in this case, eight, relative to the people that don't have the exposure and don't have the outcome, in this case, 12. So our fraction over here looks like this, two-thirds relative to eight-twelfths, which, once again, is one. Now, you'll notice the odds are a little different than risk here. Odds are 0.6, but the odds ratio is still one. So in this case, everything tallies out to one. Now, another way of thinking of this before we go on we just went horizontally across that two by two chart, right? But you can also think of this vertically. So in the case of relative risk, you can look at the outcome in those exposed relative to those not exposed, okay? As a ratio against the total number of people exposed relative to the total people not exposed. Now, mathematically, this is just an algebraic rearrangement of the equation, but this is what you ultimately get. I think this is helpful because when you look at odds ratios, this makes sense for why odds ratios tend to be so much better in case control situations because now you're looking at people with the outcome who were exposed relative to those who were not exposed, 
compared to those that didn't develop the outcome who were exposed relative to those who were not exposed. You never go into the total column. What that means is it's useful in case control studies where the true incidence of the disease, the true total, is unknown. Right? Because the total is fabricated. You select in case control studies how many people are in the outcome and the not outcome group versus in a cohort study where you're marching forwards and you're, you're watching in a, a certain selection, hopefully a representative sample of your population, and you're finding out how many people develop the disease. So you actually have a true, hopefully a true incidence or prevalence, depending on what kind of study you're doing. Okay, so this is why odds ratio, to reiterate, is useful in a case control study, where you can't really use a relative risk in a case control study. All right, moving on for a different example. We're going to add a couple of exposures here. So now we have a much higher incidence of exposures out of the same total in. And we're going to throw these into different risk categories. Now, you can kind of eyeball this and see that there is still a pretty similar ratio, right? But just to prove ourselves, let's go ahead and pull these out into their respective categories. Let's look at relative risk. So in this case, there are 11 people with the outcome of choice out of the same total. All right. And this is going to yield a risk of outcome of 0.73 in the exposed group and 0.7 in the not exposed group. So you still have a relative risk of one. But what this essentially says is in this population cohort, you've got about a 70 or 75 percent chance of developing the outcome we're looking for. Now, the important part about this is it demonstrates the difference between risk and odds because the odds are almost three to one. All right, there it's 11 to four, which is about three to one that you're going to develop the outcome of interest in the exposure group. And it's a little over two to one in the not exposed group. Now, this is insignificant and still yields an odds ratio of about one. But you can see that the, these are much different numbers. And remember, that's because the odds are the outcome relative to the no outcome group, not, as in relative risk, the outcome relative to the total group of exposures or non-exposed. Now let's look at one last group here to show that these numbers can ultimately be considerably different. Now in this case, you can see that if you have the exposure, you're clearly at a higher risk of developing the outcome we're looking at than if you don't have the exposure. So when we throw these up, your relative risk, so your risk of developing the outcome if you have the exposure is 10 out of 14, which yields a risk of about 70%. So 70% of people who have the exposure we're looking at will develop the outcome. Relative to two out of uh, out of 10 in the not exposed group, about 20%. So you've got a relative risk of about 3.5. So you're a little over three times more likely to develop the outcome we're looking at if you have the exposure. Now, compare this to odds ratios. The odds ratio here is 10 to 4, not 10 out of 14, but it's 10 to 4, or about 2.5. So 2.5 to 1 that you're going to develop the outcome we're looking at if you have the exposure. This is compared to the 2 to 8, okay, or about 1 to 4 if you don't have the exposure. Okay, so we're comparing the 2.5 to 1 to the 1 out of 4, which yields an odds ratio of 10. So our relative risk is 3.5. Our odds ratio is 10. This this creates the appearance of a much inflated effect size if you only mention the odds ratio of 10. And how this is commonly misinterpreted, particularly in the media and in the public's perception of medical research, is you're 10 times more likely to get the outcome if you have this exposure, which is not true. This is a ratio of odds. So it's not as intuitive, particularly on a public level, whereas relative risk means exactly what it says. You're 3.5 times more likely to have the outcome of interest if you have the exposure. Now, this is very similar to fishing stories, right? Particularly when odds ratios are misinterpreted as relative risk. Uh, 
we start making things sound much bigger than they really are. Now, some general rules about how this happens, and this isn't perfect, but it gives you an idea for the significance of how much an odds ratio will misinterpret a risk ratio. Notice that an odds ratio will over or underestimate the relative risk partially based on the initial risk. So if you have a very low initial risk, there's a low chance, unless the odds ratio is very, very high or very, very small, that you're gonna make a significant difference in the overall number. But as that risk increases, the initial risk in the population increases, you can see that the number or the percentage that an odds ratio will either overestimate or underestimate increases significantly. You can also see that at an odds ratio of, say, 0.7 or 0.9 on the low side or 1.5 or 2 on the high side, at those numbers, it doesn't typically tend to make an, a significant difference um, if it's misinterpreted as the, as the risk ratio. But when you get to odds that are very low, so 0 0.1, 0 0.3, or very high, so 5 and up, you start seeing significant differences from your risk ratio. And these are the cases in which these get misinterpreted, often to significant effect. Now, we talked about this earlier. Odds are useful in case control studies. And the reason is when you look at your 2x2 two two table, you have your cases, which you select. And you have your controls, which again, you select. So you're determining the grand total in each of these categories. These are the only two groups you actually get to look at here. And if we remember from earlier, odds only require, or odds ratios only require these four boxes. You don't need to know the actual total, the actual population incidence. Now in this case, the relative risk, if we were going to assume that this was a representative sample, we could calculate the relative risk, and we'd find that the risk with exposure is 69%. So 69% of the total, right? The risk of developing the outcome without the exposure is 35%, which gives us a relative risk of two. The odds ratio, on the other hand, gives us nine outcomes in the exposure group relative to four and the uh, that don't develop the outcome, so 9 to 4, or 2.25, so 2.25 to 1. And the non-exposed group, 9 developed the outcome for 17 that don't, which gives us an odds of 0.5. Now, this yields an odds ratio of 4. So remember, our relative risk was 2, our odds was 4. Now, there are a few important things to note about this. Number one, they both travel in the same direction but we're assuming that we knew the actual population incidence, the actual total, so the A plus B and the C plus D, when we did the relative risk calculation, which we don't, okay? To some degree, we, we manipulated that result based on how many people we chose with the outcome and without the outcome. So the relative risk in this case isn't actually a relevant number, but the odds ratio only used people at the outcome and in the no outcome group. We didn't care about the total. And so this is a more reliable way of measuring this. And in particular, this is useful when you're comparing st multiple studies um, and particularly across different kinds of studies. So this is a good way of comparing case controls to cohorts. Um, and to take a quick chance to throw up a good quote regarding uh, the retrospective nature of life. Good quote from Steve Jobs. Now... This is kind of a difficult concept uh, to understand. So we're going to try a couple of different examples where we look at different ways um, that you could do a study, different population samples, and how you could get different risks versus odds. So let's start in the group in the top left. This is a pretty small number. You have a pretty high pre prevalence um, of disease, right? You've got 13 uh, out of 68 who develop a disease, all right? But it's pretty small numbers, right? So you would expect pretty wide confidence intervals in this case. Now, the odds ratio here is just 7 out of 6 uh, out of 10 out of 58, right? And this is doing it the vertical way. Remember, you could also do it uh, horizontally, so 7 out of 10 
over 6 over 58. Um, and this is just algebra. But you're comparing just those four boxes. We're not looking for totals. Now, if we're going to assume that this is actually a representative population, we could calculate a relative risk. So let's do that just so we have some method of comparison when we get done with all this. So this is seven out of, once again, we're assuming that this is the, the actual representative population. So seven plus 10, you've got 17 is actually the total number exposed. This is actually the population prevalence relative to six out of 64. All right, and this is gonna yield a relative risk of 4.4, assuming this is a true representative sample and an odds ratio of 6.7. Now, the odds ratio is greater and this is pretty typical, um, but they do both travel in the same direction. So at least you can, even if you don't know the relative risk, you can at least tell that there is a positive correlation between the exposure and the outcome. Now let's look at the uh, population sample in the bottom left. Now we've got a lot more people in the no outcome group now. The ratios are similar. All right, but the non-disease population is much, much larger, larger. We've diluted out the outcomes in a much less sick population. So what does this do? Well, our relative risk here is seven out of one, uh, 1,003. And our, uh, and our risk in the non-exposed group is six out of essentially 5,000. Now odds, once again, we're gonna do vertical here because to me, this makes better sense is seven outcomes in the exposed group to six in the non-exposed groups. And then the ratio of no outcomes in the exposed group, 996, to no outcomes in the not exposed group, 4678. And this is gonna yield a relative risk of 5.4 and an odds of 5.5. So actually pretty similar to our top group and much more similar numbers. Now let's do one last group where we really crank up the number of outcomes. So now we have 700 exposed outcomes and 600 non-exposed outcomes. So this is a very sick group. Okay, I've carefully selected the people I'm studying so that I identify exactly who I'm looking at. And in this case, our relative risk is one but our odds ratio is 6.5. So now you can see that if you go by odds ratios in this group, okay, they look, it seems to be vastly more common in the exposed group than the non-exposed group. But if you look at the relative risk, it doesn't seem that impressive at all. You're just 1.1 times more likely to have the disease if you have the exposure than if you don't. When we put all these on the same page, you can see that the only difference between these is that I changed certain elements by a factor of 10. So between the first and second group, I increased the no outcome groups by about a factor of 10. Between the first and third, I increased the outcome group by a factor of 10. And you see pretty large jumps in the relative risk, all the way from 5.4, all the way down to 1.1 but the odds ratio stays fairly stable right around six. And this is why outcome or odds ratios are useful across studies and across population prevalences. This stability despite prevalence is, is the great benefit of odds ratio, but it also maintains its stability across a range of risks. So for instance, if you have a cohort of patients and there's a large variation of risk among that cohort, for instance, say you have 100 people who have sepsis, but 20 of those people are otherwise young and healthy and have no other risk factors. And 20 of those people are older than 85 and have congestive heart failure and diabetes and have had multiple surgeries. You can understand that within that single cohort, that group of people who has sepsis, some of them are fairly well and some of them are fairly sick. Now, odds ratios actually maintain their utility in this group, but a relative risk falls apart because for instance, if you have uh, that higher risk group, say with a risk of death of 38%, uh, and say their relative risk of a certain exposure is about 2.6. So their relative risk of death when you multiply those, you actually get a final risk of death of 
which doesn't make a lick of sense. You can't have more than 100% of death. And we all know that even out of that 20 very sick people, not all of them are going to die immediately. Now, odds ratios, on the other hand, maintains its utility because it tells you for every so many of those people that die, a certain number will live. So mathematically, it actually carries a bit more weight across a range of risks as well as across different studies. Now, there is something called an adjusted odds ratio, and this uses logistic regression. We're not going to go over this, but basically what this does is this uh, works its way backwards, hence the regression portion of this, and you're trying to find out which of the elements um, are independent risk factors. So an adjusted odds ratio basically goes through this process to find out um, which risk factors independently um, add risk to developing an outcome. Now, in general, odds ratios should not be used to elimate, uh, estimate relative risk. And the reason for this is because when relative risk is greater than one, as we've seen, odds ratios tend to overestimate. You'll get an odds ratio of six when a relative risk may be 1.2. When risk ratios are less than one, odds ratios tend to underestimate. So you may see an odds ratio of 0.1 when the relative risk is 0.85, right? And once again, we saw that on our graphs earlier. But what you can tell is that a positive odds ratio typically indicates there is a positive correlation between the exposure and the outcome you're looking for. And if the odds ratio is a percentage, if it's 0.5 or 0.1, then what that suggests is there's a negative correlation between an exposure and an outcome. If you have the exposure, you're less likely to develop the outcome. Although you probably can't tell exactly what that relative risk is, so you can't say that you are so much more likely or less likely um, to develop that outcome with the risk. Graphically, what you're basically looking at is, um, as the risk ratio increases like this, your odds ratio increases more or less exponentially, similarly in a downward direction. Like we said, a positive risk ratio equals a positive odds ratio, and a negative uh, risk ratio equals a negative odds ratio. To rehash real quickly, uh, risk ratios and odds ratios estimate the strength of a relationship between two binary variables. Do you have a disease? Do you not? Relative risk refers to a percentage of the total population with the disease. It, it demands an actual population prevalence which more or less means it demands a prospective study. It does poorly when there's a broad range of disease within a population. Like we talked about in the sepsis example, if you have very sick and very well patients in a, in a group, this tends to break down. But it's intuitive. A relative risk of three, or a risk ratio of three means that somebody with the exposure is three times more likely to develop the disease of interest than somebody without the exposure. Odds, on the other hand, refers to the ratio of diseased to undiseased. Okay, it's a 3 to 1 risk, a 5 to 1 risk, a 1 to 10 risk, whatever the case. It's relatively independent of prevalence. It means, what it means is you can't make assumptions about the general prevalence of a disease based only on an odds ratio. Right, that requires the study be appropriately performed and usually requires a prospective study. It's relatively unaffected by variations in disease severity within a population. So it's a fairly stable measurement of risk. The downside is it's not terribly intuitive. But the good news is it does tend to travel in the same, well, it has to travel in the same direction as relative risk. So a positive odds ratio means a positive relative risk. Although you may not be able to uh, firmly establish the magnitude of difference based only on the odds ratio. So hopefully that helps you understand to some degree relative risk versus odds ratio. I think this is an important concept, particularly in the study of, um, of diagnostic markers and diagnostic studies in which these are frequently used. And these frequently falsely inflate the uh, size of effect you may get from a diagnostic study being looked at. Okay. These also are used commonly in the media, and it's very important that we understand how to interpret these um, so that we can appropriately address these situations when they come up. Uh, and with that, that is the end of this lecture on uh, risk ratios versus odds ratios. Thanks for listening. Um, until next time.